Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Signal or Noise. This is episode 24. Charlie Bellella here, and with me, as always, Peter Malouk. Today, Peter, we're going to run through a few interesting topics. Number one, this is probably the question we get most from clients, their biggest fear of retirement, running out of money. So we're going to run through a lot of different examples of the worst periods in history and hopefully set people's minds at ease. Number two, we're going to talk about lottery tickets and lottery stocks, some of the parallels there. And we're going to end, as we always do, with signal or noise. The end of a pretty long uptrend just ended. What does that mean for the market going forward? We'll try to answer that question for everyone today. All right, so let's dig in. Biggest fear in retirement that's running out of money. But first, I want to touch on this interesting poll Northwestern Mutual does every year. And I'm sure you saw this, Peter. This was a pretty interesting stat here. This is the average number of people think they need to have by retirement. It's up now to almost 1.5 million. And that stat alone isn't that interesting. What's interesting to me is how much it's increased over the last four years, 54% increase. So four years ago, we were looking at 950,000 in the same survey today, 1.46 million. And we know the biggest driver of that is inflation. Now, the Fed is telling us and the government's telling us, well, inflation's only been 20% over the last four years, but it seems like people are ex either extrapolating that going forward or they're feeling like the actual inflation rate and what they're going to need is going to be a lot higher. Is that what you think's going on here or something different? Yeah, I think both of those things you said are going on. One, uh, the inflation rate has been dramatically understated. Everybody knows it. And I think what you see is people adjusting what they feel they they need to survive, uh, what they need to thrive in retirement. And I think those upward trends are spot on. I don't think anyone's overreacting. You need a lot more money than you in the future than you you used to. And especially if you look at you know, the boomers don't feel like they need a lot more because they're already retired, right? But for somebody who's going to retire 10, 20, 30 years out, uh, it makes a lot of sense to adjust that number, especially accounting for the time value of money way, way upwards. And I think they're, they're on the right mark on what they're going to need. Yeah, always always better to be conservative, right? And save more. That's a good problem to have later if you have too much. And the boomers, I know you like to always tweet out that uh, video of the boomers dancing because <laughs> they've locked in those ultra low <laughs> mortgage rates. So they're sitting pretty. The rest of us still have some work to do, it seems, by the rest of the survey, which is looking at the gap between what people have actually saved and what they think they'll need for retirement. We talked about this last year, but it's still stunning. It's like over a million dollar difference now, 1.37 million between what people have, the average savings, 88,000, and what they think that they'll need in retirement. You can see there's a difference from generation to generation. Obviously, boomers have more money saved, but the overriding message, Peter, I think, is get started as early as possible. And you and I have talked about this on the 10 steps to a million. It can seem like a lot. A million dollars is not a small amount of money, but you have to let time and compounding work in your favor. So we showed the example Roth IRA. You can put now up to 7,000 per year. And if you just did that, 7,000 per year, and that will increase, but I didn't even include that there. If you just did that from age 25 to 64, and you compounded at 8% per year, you didn't interrupt that compounding, you would actually have over 1.9 million by the time you're 65. So it's doable, but it seems daunting going in, right? A hundred percent. I was just talking at a high school last week and I just said, like the biggest uh, asset uh, an investor can have is just time. And so the millennials that are worried about how much they need, it's actually much easier for hit them to hit their target than anybody else simply because of time. And if they did nothing, but contribute to a Roth IRA and their employer retirement account, they'd automatically become a multimillionaire if they were owners you know, of equities in, in those portfolios. I think the other thing millennials and Generation X think about is boomers aren't worried about getting Social Security. They're getting it. But if you're a millennial, you're not, you're not factoring that math into your equation. Yet another reason that they should have more. But they've got that the, you know, investor's best friend. They've got time on their side. Just start putting money away. It'll work out. That's awesome. So you spoke to those kids. Anything stand out from kind of the conversation with them? What are their concerns? Are they getting, did they get the math of these numbers and the importance of it by the end of your talk? Yeah, I think there's nothing more fascinating to a, uh, someone who's like 18 or 19 than the power of compounding and the rule of 72. <laughs> I think they all really 
anchor to that rule of 72. And for you know some of our listeners who might not know what it is, you take 72 divided by your rate of return. That's how many years it takes your money to double. And I think that you know people start doing that math on how many times, if you're in your 20s and in your first job, you put money away, how many times that money doubles. Um, it's just an automatic path to having millions of dollars in retirement. I think it's very empowering for, for people that understand that when they're younger. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. So let's dig into the fears. And this is a question that we get all the time. Let's say you, you did you did your part, you've saved a million dollars, and uh, you're in retirement now. That biggest fear is now front and center. Okay. I'm, uh, how am I going to not outlive uh, this money that I've saved up for all this time? And what I like to point out to people is if you have a simple con conservative portfolio, and we look at the three worst time periods in the last hundred years, you actually would have been okay. So the average retirement is around 20 years in duration. I'm looking at the three worst periods. Number one being the Great Depression, World War II. We can't get much worse than that. Number two, I'm looking at Vietnam, stagflationary era from the 60s to the early 80s. And number three would be the dot-com bubble, global financial crisis period. So if you had the misfortune of retiring right before these events, how would you have fared? And I've looked at a simple thing, a million dollar portfolio, 50-50 in stocks and bonds. Can't get much simpler than that. And at the end of each year, I said, you just rebalance back to that 50-50. No other changes, Peter. And here are the results. Hopefully, this will be comforting for people. Great Depression, World War II, arguably the worst period in history for a US investor. Certainly, for the last hundred years, we've seen just enormous decline during the depression, right? You had stocks down over 80%. So we just, we'll talk about the 5% pullback in the S&P later. People are feeling a little stressed about that. That is nothing. Even the bear market we had in 2022, nothing compared to that. But if you had stuck with that portfolio and rebalanced actually into those declines, adding more to the stocks, taking away from bonds. And for bonds here, I'm just looking at 10-year treasury bonds. You actually would have been okay. And you're looking at 20 years later, Peter, this is probably shocking to a lot of people. That million dollars, even with taking 4% withdrawals, adjusted higher or lower for inflation, you'd still be left with $715,000 at the end of that 20-year period. And you had to go through the Great Depression and World War II and all the rest of it. Yeah, and for perspective, the Great Depression, the stock market was down more than 90%. I think what people forget about is that these stocks were still paying dividends, and dividends were a very substantial part of softening that blow. I remember the New York Times did an article on this maybe five or 10 years ago. I don't know if you've seen it, Charlie, but it basically said a 50-50 portfolio without withdrawals, if you counted dividends, which of course you should count, uh, broke even in seven or eight years. I mean, that, that's the worst in all of history with the stock market down 90%. And so the power of rebalancing, counting the income from the bonds, the, dividend, the dividends from the stocks, these are real companies making real money, even in a recession or depression where they make less money, it still works out for the long-term investor. And if you're really worried about retirement, the key is to just have enough money, not in stocks, so that if you have a three to five year horrific downward trend of the market, we've got a place to go to get the capital you need. And that removes most of the sequence of, of return risk in the portfolio and should give a retiree comfort. Right. And you and I touched on that, on the Dave Ramsey comment saying mm -hmm. 4% basically is for losers <laughs> and you could do much, much higher than that. And you could go 100% growth stocks. Will be This would be the example where that obviously goes wrong and right. gets wiped out. It's sequence of returns. And if you have that big drawdown early on, you're not going to recover from it if you're 100% in stocks and certainly not if you have a high, very high withdrawal rate. Number two, Vietnam War, stagflationary era. This is probably more front and center today. People are more worried about that stagflation risk, higher inflation risk. And if we look here, if you retired in 1962 to 1981, you got a $1 million portfolio and you're left with 792000 by the end of it. So similar story here. If you stuck it out, you would actually be okay. Not to say during during it, you're not going to be nervous and frightened that this is going to run out. Inflation's obviously very high, but stocks, have, as we often talk about, 
best long-term inflation hedge in over this 20 years actually did very well. And this is including dividends as well. And I'm just going to talk about number three here because this is what is most recent and most people are thinking about or they remember this or if you're retired at the, at the end of 1999, you're probably thinking this is going to be pretty bad, Peter, right? We had three consecutive down years, 2000, 2001, 2002. And fast forward 20 years later, if you took your 4% withdrawals, you're actually doing actually doing just fine. You're actually left with more than you started with, even though you took out 4% per year adjusted for inflation. Pretty remarkable the comeback, right? Since the dot-com bubble. And and by the way, you have that financial crisis in here as well, which took stock da- stocks down over 50% as well. Yeah. Through all these crises, you hear about people who say they got wiped out. There's a, one of our top advisors here came into the profession her parents were wiped out in in one of these down markets and you get wiped out. There's a couple of ways to do it, but one way is you time your way through this market. The market goes down, you go to cash, you don't go back in at the right time. Yeah, you can cause permanent damage that way. Or second, you're taking stock specific or sector specific risk. You've overbet on the dot coms or whatever it is. Today, it might be cryptocurrencies and it doesn't work out. And then you wind up left with nothing. But the diversified investor, that's how these charts work out. We look at the worst parts of time, of all time, as you've shown, the diversified investor got through all of them, 100% of the time, no exceptions. And I think that's the key distinction. Yeah, sometimes bonds can really be helpful in enduring that depression, the deflationary environment that mm. persisted there. Bonds did remarkably well. And then you were able to take from those bonds and add to the stocks, which had got crushed. And of course, they recover and you're benefiting from that recovery. Okay. Okay. Now, for the people out there, I'm sure there's three things that you're thinking. This is what they always get the pushback, Peter. Number one would be, well, what if I live more than 20 years? What about 30 years? I tested that. You actually would have been much, much better off because that 10-year period following the 20-year period was enormous following the Great Depression. And obviously, early 1980s, you had a huge run as well. We don't have a full 20, 30-year period from the dot-com bubble, but obviously, the last few years have been very good for the stock market as well. So you would have been just fine sticking with that 50-50 even at 30 years during these worst periods. Number two would be what about 5%? And there is a number, right? That's too high. But I tested 5%. Even there, you would have been less left with less when you when you ended your retirement, when you passed away, but you still wouldn't have been zero. It just would have been a little bit tense there within. <laughs> and then number three, I want you to take this question because this is the always the impossible one to answer. And I have my own way of answering this, but what do you say to people who say, well, that's all well and good that you've showed me the worst for the last hundred years, but what if the next 20 years are going to be worse than these three examples? Yeah. And this is one of those things like it's very hard not to be optimistic. And as you know, we're if we look at the t- markets expand when there's technological innovation, we're sitting at, at on the cusp of the greatest technological innovation that has ever happened in the history of man- mankind. We need consumers. We've got over a billion people coming out of poverty all over the world. They are going to be uh, consumers. It's very hard to look at the past and look at being alive during the Vietnam War and the assassination of uh, John F. Kennedy and Bobby Kennedy and Martin Luther King and all that chaos. And then looking at uh, the 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 uh, all the people that died from we, we were all upset about COVID. The Spanish flu is a much bigger deal. And then you went into World War One, being alive at that point, or World War Two, and and the Great Depression. And we look at all these things are much worse than today. And anything that's happening today with the regional wars and COVID and whatever we're complaining about with presidents and the economy, the, the world is not perfect, but the stock market doesn't care about most of the stuff we care about. It cares about future earnings, which means we need consumers, we need innovation. We've got both. We also have very high functioning financial markets. We understand a lot more about the economy than we ever did. So that doesn't mean the future is going to be perfect and everything's going to work out. It means if you cannot be optimistic about this, you cannot be optimistic about any period in all of human history. And as you just showed, all the other periods worked out fine for the patient investor. No question. And what I like to say is that if you think that the future is going to be worse than a period that had 80 plus percent stock market decline, 25 percent unemployment and a world war that killed tens of millions of people, then you really can't be an investor. (laughs) You have to put your then money under your mattress, go back to that prepper conversation that you and I had, do something else. 
But the bigger risk for that type of person is going to be keeping up with inflation, right? So if you do that, we know that the dollar value of the dollar is going to be worse less in the future than today. And if you don't have these assets generating income, generating growth, I think that's a much bigger risk than the future <laughs> being right. worse than the past. So just keep that in mind. And what I like to say doing this analysis, I prefer looking at specific time periods because as you know, you could do a million simulations nowadays. And we do that for with the financial planning saying X, Y, and Z, but stress testing it with the three worst periods. It's, this is real for people to see. And the fact that you would have made it through these periods with that fifth, simple 50-50 portfolio should be very comforting to anyone. So if you've done a great job retiring, you have a portfolio set up, you have a withdrawal rate that makes sense, enjoy your retirement. You're going to get through it. Like you said, there's going to be plenty of bad news along the way, but unlikely, very unlikely to be worse than these three examples. And if you're thinking about your retirement, you're getting closer, even if you're 10, 20 years away, the best thing you could do is start planning today. How do I get to that number that I need? How do I figure out what a withdrawal rate will sustain me during retirement? We can help you with all that creative planning, 300 billion plus in assets under management and advisement. With, we're in all 50 states. I'll have a link in the show notes. So definitely reach out. We're here to help. Number two, Peter, lottery tickets and lottery stocks. Lottery tickets always been a fascinating subject for me. I put out this tweet uh, last week saying, uh, update this. I update this every year. Americans spent $113 billion on lottery tickets last year, which was more than they spent on movies, books, concerts, and sports tickets. Here's the, here's the kicker, combined. Does that blow you away? Has that been adjusted for Taylor Swift concerts? Because I, I I wonder if it can still be true. Um, it it actually blows me away, and I've obviously followed you for a long time, and it's amazing how much attention this gets because I think it blows everybody's mind. But it speaks to a combination of the hope and desperation that so many people have. You know, um, it's incredible how much money is spent, and just this is just one segment of gambling in the United States. It's a stunning industry. Yeah, we're seeing it right across the board with sports betting just proliferating all different yeah. states. I mean, it seems like every other commercial when you watch a sports game now is for a different betting app. Right. Uh, and it's become that culture of gambling. I don't really support this. And we, we could talk about it like the government promoting this type of gambling, getting in the business of this type of gambling when you have these type of odds. So we're talking about Meg and the biggest money that people are spending on is those big ticket winnings, right? The mega millions, the Powerball, whenever it goes a billion, over a billion dollars, you see people lining up to play these. Uh, and obviously the odds of them winning doesn't go up, but in their mind, they feel like I have to play. If you don't, there's that saying, if you don't play, you can't win all the rest of it. But we're talking about one in 300 million for mega millions, one in 292 million for Powerball, Still, we don't look at that as Danny Kahneman said. He said, for emotionally significant events, the size of the probability simply doesn't matter. What matters is that possibility of winning. And if you look at what people are spending now, you could see the increases here in this chart. We're talking about over 100 billion. And the crazy thing is the government is getting about 30% of that. So they're getting a bigger VIG than Vegas gets. Vegas takes about 10% off the top, the, top. Mm -hmm. the government's getting about 30%. So 30 something billion a year they're getting in revenue. And this is an interesting question, moral question, I guess you, you might call it like, should the government be in the business of raising revenue through these lottery it's ticket sales when they know uh, this is a huge harmful effect, and as, as I'll go through on many of the poorest segments of society. It's absolutely horrible. It's disgusting. And it's because it preys on the people that can least afford to be doing it to subsidize government programs. It's it's a, it's for, it's a terrible bet, first of all. If you wanted to bet, the better thing than a lottery ticket is to stake the same amount and bet some incredible combination of events on a legal sp sports betting app. And you've got a better probability of a high value uh, outcome where you can take a dollar and turn it into many, many, many fold. The government shouldn't be in the business of doing something that causes so much damage to so many people. And I, I find it incredulous when they take this little tiny piece of the budget and allocate it towards Gamblers Anonymous and things like that. The damage that they, they create from this is so much more significant than the benefit that they, than they get.
Right. And then they like to say, oh, we're spending some of it on education and other things. And therefore, you know, you shouldn't care that that we're in the business of doing that. But I mean, come on, look at look at the damage that you're causing. And certainly given uh, at least in New York, where I live, they certainly haven't lowered tax rates because they've gotten all this new gambling revenue. So it's just an additional program to, for them to spend money on. Who knows? I don't think there's any auditing or accountability. Who knows where it's actually going? But I think this is the biggest problem, the biggest argument to say the government at least shouldn't be in the business of this. If you look at the relationship between income and the money spent on lotteries, it's it's a crazy relationship where the poorest 1% of zip codes are spending way more than the richest 1% of zip codes. I, here, they quantified it, the economists here. If you look at the poorest 1%, they're spending $600 a year, which is 5% of their income. And we know for many people, that's an average, right? For many people, they're probably spending much higher percentage of that. And if we look at the richest 1% of zip, zip codes, it's 150. So 4x between the, the richest and the poorest, and 30 times more if you're looking at it as a share of income. It's the biggest regressive tax there is. Yeah, it's... It's ter- it's like a lot of things. It looks like it benefits society and it actually harms it by harming the people in the position that can least afford uh, the damage. So I want to make the parallel here between this type of gambling. And I know you, you've talked about this a lot, gambling in the stock market. If you're an investor and you're investing for 30 years, you're adding money to your 401k, that is not gambling, right? You're not betting on a penny stock. You're not putting it all in on this high volatility uh, binary event. That is investing. But there's a distinction here because a lot of people have that same behavioral bias that they bring to the lottery. They bring it to the stock market, right? They have this overconfidence. They're not uh, pricing in the risk. They're, so they're expecting uh, their expected return is much higher than reality. And they're not diversifying. So they're putting it all in on these high risk volatile stocks. And there've been many studies, they call it the lottery effect that show that you actually get lower returns because they're essentially bidding up these stocks to higher prices than their fundamental value. So by the time you're buying into that, you're actually going to end up with a lower return. And I think the best example of this, of course, in recent years was that meme stock craze that we had in early 2021. And just walk me through what you said in this tweet here about day trading and meme stocks and uh, should investing be exciting? This was the peak of of NFT, SPAC, meme stuff. And I was tweeting a lot about how stupid all of these things were and getting absolutely (laughs) destroyed uh, on, on Twitter. But I do think this aged well. I mean, when when you're investing in the markets in a diversified way, you you are going to win over time, uh, just like the house in Vegas wins. So it's not gambling; it's the opposite. You're on the other side of the table, where the longer you do it, the more likely you are to win. But when you start trading things that have no earnings, back then it was a lot of the specs and the meme stocks and the NFTs. And today, and I'm going to die on this hill. It's still 99.9 percent of cryptocurrencies. All of these things eventually don't work out. And it doesn't, it sometimes takes one year, sometimes it takes 15 years, but unless there's real value, you're gambling. You may as well buy the lottery ticket. So we have the the results here in terms of the meme stocks, at least pretty much all of them down significantly from the peak. Many of them now have gone bankrupt, Bed Bath & Beyond. I think Express, we just heard, went bankrupt this week. AMC, I know near and dear to your heart, but Mm -hmm seems like not too much longer in their lifeline. Mm. Uh, Virgin Galactic, the names go on and on, obviously GameStop being the uh, the fan favorite, uh, but reality is setting back in, right? And yeah. you and I took a lot of hate for this because we were just, we were trying to warn people against that lottery phenomenon, right? The people that were least able to lose this money were the ones most likely to be speculating on it. And unfortunately, you had billionaires out there like Mark Cuban and other people like cheering these people yeah. on, which I thought was an absolute travesty to see. They're they're cheering them on, saying, "Go in, you know, stick it to the man by buying these uh, speculative stocks that are not trading on fundamentals, and that's going to you know hurt the big guy." And in the end, 
No, it only hurt that person that they e- egged on in terms of getting him into these stocks. And meanwhile, you know, they either weren't involved or they had almost nothing in them. Yeah. I mean, that, that to me was the part that just annoyed me the most. Elon Musk telling people to buy uh, Dogecoin, Mark Cuban advocating for Dogecoin and these meme stocks and NFTs. I mean, wh- where you know that there is no chance that he had more than 1% of his money in any of those things. And that's not the way they were talking to investors. You know, the people making investment decisions based on a tip they hear on Twitter or a billionaire saying something on Twitter are probably the people that can least afford it and are more likely to put a bunch of eggs in one basket. So I don't take any pleasure in this chart. I think it's a tragedy because the people that lost that much money, those were not the institutional investors. Those are not the the long-term investors with big accounts. These were the people that could least afford to lose it. We're trying to take some small amount and make it a very, very big amount uh, to to maybe break the cycle of poverty or or you know, live a live a freer life. And so there's a lot of there's a lot of stories behind all of these bars. Yeah, and there'll be more stories in the future, just given yeah. social media and herd behavior. I don't know if we'll, we'll ever see that moment in time with the uniqueness of the stimulus and everything and the IPO window all at once, but. There'll, there'll, there'll be other examples and just try to keep your head at that point. And in the end, the hedge funds weren't hurt by this. They were helped by this. Yeah, yeah Everyone heard about Melvin Capital. That yeah. was one example. But there was many others that benefited from this, either by holding these stocks on the long side and then eventually on the crack, they took the other side when they came down. And the whole notion of hold these stocks forever, well, that's not simply the way market works. Everyone's going to cheat game theory That's right. and try to be the first one out. So yeah. what's a better thing to do rather than playing the lottery or playing lottery stocks, investing consistently for the long run. And this go back to this chart, 7,000 a year, go a long way. Even if you put that $600 per year right into the market for the long run, that person's going to have something to show for it at the end in, 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 instead of just throwing it away in the lottery or these lottery stocks. Okay, let's end quickly here. Signal or noise. Peter, we talked last uh, time about how everything seemed to be way too awesome. There was all news was good news. Such low volatility in the market. Very rare to see. Now we have the first pullback of the year. Not huge, five and a half percent. But we know this is now not 1995, not 2017 years where we had no pullback whatsoever greater than 3%. What's the reason here? You could you could talk about inflation, obviously the Fed not cutting rates. We talked about that. How they shouldn't be cutting rates and now they seem to be talking about maybe September or some people saying not at all this year. Now we have Iran and Israel conflict. Before I get into the uh, uptrend ending here, any thoughts here on the recent pullback or other than that this is just something we've seen time and again since March 2009 and no one could tell you how big it's going to be but likely it won't be the end of the world just like these won't be these past ones weren't the end of the world as well perfectly said I've got nothing to add (laughs) that's exactly right so VIX barely barely jumping here we're up to 19 at historical average 19 and a half so this is this is not a big correction not a lot of fear just yet the end of an uptrend here, Peter, we had this long period above the 50-day moving average, 10th longest in history. Is this a signal for you that now we're below that 50-day moving average and this long uptrend has ended? Signal or noise? Many technicians would disagree, but I call it noise, unpredictable, um, not enough information. First of all, regardless, no way we're going to make a short-term trade based on that. No indication of where the market's heading from here. We could have a recovery. We could be heading into a real real correction. What say you, Charlie? Yeah. What I say is this is a small sample. So never read anything from a small sample. That was such a unique period that we had for the first three months of the year. We were saying before this pullback, don't expect that to continue. But all I would say now is we're transitioning to a different phase and we could shoot right back up to new highs. That wouldn't surprise me. It wouldn't surprise me if this 5% became 10%. A year later, more often than not, the stock market's up even after breaking below it. But you never know. It could it could be another 2007 where we ended a long streak and the market's down there, of course. But it also could be a period where we just have a normal year, a few 5 to 10% pullbacks, and the market ends the year higher than where it began. And I just want to point out here in terms of where we were tracking in terms of the average year, 
we were way above average. And now we're with that pullback, Peter, we're just right around average. S&P up 5% here in April. That's right along where the average year is done. And there's going to be a lot of people tell you where the market's going to end and how this path is going to go from here to the rest of the year. Don't listen to any of them. Stick to your plan. Invest for the long term. This is all just noise in the short term. And certainly don't make any wholesale changes based on something breaking below a moving average. Okay, with that, we'll end it right there, Peter. If you're watching this on YouTube, take a moment, hit that subscribe button, hit that like button, leave a comment, and we'll see you next time on Signal or Noise.